Well, thank you uh, very much, Rob, for the introduction. Uh, Mr. Barry, where is sir? Um, for your generous support and all of you for coming this evening. My talk tonight um, begins with a description of a gathering in Berlin 230 years ago on the evening of December 17, 1783. It was a meeting of the secret Mittwochgesellschaft, or the Wednesday Club, a club dedicated to free discussion of political, social, and philosophical issues of the day. Among the members of this group were the co-editors of the Berlinische Monatschrift, or the Berlin Monthly, a monthly dedicated to the idea of public enlightenment. Other members of the group included leading clergy, government officials, and philosophers, among them the great enlightenment philosopher Moses Mendelssohn. The agenda for this December evening, discussion of the question, what is to be done toward the enlightenment of the citizenry. Leading discussion was Johann Mösen, the personal physician of Frederick the Great, the monarch of Prussia. Prussia, at this time, being a state in what was officially called the Holy Roman Empire of the German nation, though, as Voltaire put it, it was neither holy nor Roman nor an empire. In order to facilitate discussion, Mürsen asked that the group first step back for a moment and clarify the concept that was at the center of the enterprise, the concept of enlightenment itself. What is enlightenment? It appears that the question was hardly answered to everyone's satisfaction that evening because before the month was out, a clergyman in attendance at the meeting, Johann Zöllner, would publish Mürsen's question in an essay in the Berlinische Monatschrift's December edition, in which we find these words. What is enlightenment? This question, which is almost as important as what is truth, should indeed be answered before one begins to enlighten. And still, I have never found it answered. Responses quickly fill the pages of the Berlin Monthly and would soon spill over to other journals throughout the Germanic states. As noted by Enlightenment scholars James Schmidt and Samuel Fleischacher, from whose works I draw here, by 1790, that is seven years later, discussion of the question, what is enlightenment, had become a small industry, with an article in the German Monthly classifying answers into 21 types, warning that the debate was degenerating into a Hobbesian-style war of all against all. The varied answers, in, pa in part, reflected varied interpretations of the question itself, for was it the Enlightenment as a historical era, or enlightenment as found in a person that was to be defined. Either way, most answers, including that offered by Moses Mendelssohn, identified some sort of cognitive achievement. And usually, but not always, the cognitive achievement included some combination of doctrines, more often than not, a combination of an embrace of reason, science, or both, on the one hand, and a rejection, on the other hand, of some religious tenets. The most famous response to Cyrano's question, however, was radically different. 400 miles to the east of Berlin, in the Prussian Baltic seaport city of Königsberg, one of the most influential philosophers in the history of Western philosophy, and arguably the paradigmatic philosopher of the Enlightenment himself, Immanuel Kant, read Cyrano's essay with great interest and would soon offer his response. In some ways, it is surprising that Kant did not offer the more standard doctrinal sort of response. For if anyone was well positioned to champion the advances of science while rejecting traditional religion, it was Kant, because this is precisely what he had already done. On the side of science, for example, approximately 30 years earlier, and as a great admirer of Isaac Newton, the 31-year-old Kant had been the first to present and defend the nebular hypothesis. On the side of religion, Kant's magnum opus, The Critique of Pure Reason, published just two years before Tsirno's call for explanations of enlightenment, in 1781, that is, when Kant was 57 years old. It included the devastating attack on the traditional proofs of the existence of God. Indeed, the deeply religious Moses Mendelssohn, thereafter, would refer to Kant as nothing less than the alles zermalmenden Kant. To be alles zermalmend means to be all crushing, or to look further at the etymology of the word, all grinding. So Kant had not only earned his stripes as a scientist, but also as a critic of religion, grinding, or one might say, milling 
religious doctrines to dust. So to invoke the words of Johnny Cash, as one ought whenever possible when in Nashville, Kant was thus like, quote, a miller with his mill wheel grinding. Nonetheless, Kant's response was not doctrinal. It was instead simpler and perhaps deeper. It described, above all else, an attitude or process of living, not just a doctrine, an attitude in living from which a doctrinal enlightenment might follow. In his words, the motto of the Enlightenment is sapere aude, have the courage to make use of your own understanding. Now, what does this mean exactly? Here I think it is helpful if we brief, briefly <coughs> fast forward from the 18th century to consider one of our contemporaries regularly hailed as a modern day genius and visionary. Who would that be? Steve Jobs. I recently stumbled across a 1994 interview with Jobs, I won't mention in what context, in which he reflected on his career, though actually this was 13 years before the first iPhone. Their Jobs says the following about life. Life can be much broader than you think once you discover one simple fact. And that is that everything around you that you call life was made up by people that were no smarter than you. And you can change it, you can influence it, you can build your own things that other people can use. And the minute you understand that you can poke life, push it in, and that something will pop out the other side, that you can change and mold it. That's maybe the most important thing. To shake off this erroneous notion that life is just there versus embracing it, changing it, improving it, making your mark upon it. And once you learn that, you want to change life because it's kind of messed up in a lot of ways. Once you learn that, you'll never be the same again. Here I think Jobs is making the same basic point as Kant, actually. The key is that we need to be active, grow up, not assume a passive and deferential stance in relation to the ideas and creations that surround us. Instead, recognizing the uniformly humble, or to anticipate David Wood's talk on Nietzsche next week, human all too human foundations of ideas, creations, and life around us in the works of agents just like us. We can imagine, question, and create anew, and so poke life. As Kant puts it in another essay two years later, we must not assume that authorities have some mysterious sort of agency that is inscrutable, that they are magic. In the mentioned interview, Jobs focuses on the seductive nature, the discovery of our freedom and agency, what Kant, of what Kant calls the exit from immaturity. But he doesn't mention what might keep us from doing this. Here Kant's longer response offers more detail. Enlightenment, Kant tells us, is the exit of human beings from their self-incurred immaturity. Immaturity is the inability to use one's own understanding without direction from another. This immaturity is self-incurred when its cause lies not in lack of understanding, but in lack of resolution and courage to use it without direction from another. To not exercise our agency for ourselves is immaturity because we assume the position of minors deferring to others, and this is a self-incurred immaturity, and this is a self-incurred immaturity if it is the result of our own lack of courage. But what does Kant mean by a lack of resolution and courage to use our understanding? He continues, it is because of laziness and cowardice that so great a part of mankind, after nature has long since emancipated them from other people's direction, nevertheless gladly remain minors for life, and that it becomes so easy for others to set themselves up as their guardians. It is so comfortable to be a minor. If I have a book that understands for me, a spiritual advisor, who has a conscience for me, a doctor who decides upon a regimen for me, and so forth, I need not trouble myself at all. I need not think, if only I can pay. Others will readily undertake the irksome business for me. So one basis for not choosing the life of activity is precisely that activity takes effort in thinking for ourselves about morality, health, and other matters. Indeed, 
while Kant is well known for talking in his ethics about maxims or subjective principles of action that we formulate ad hoc and even implicitly in everyday life to guide action, he also speaks of a different type of maxim that is a maxim in a richer sense. According to this sense of maxims, they are principles of conduct we've reflected on and decided will guide our life. These maxims together give us what Kant, Kant calls character. Nonetheless, as Kant describes it in his lectures, these maxims are actually rare, so that few people have character before their 40th year. Pressure's on. Instead, it is usually only once someone has reached a point of disgust with themselves over the manner in which their unsteady inclinations whipsaw them about in life that they undergo a personal revolution demanding of themselves a more active, reflective approach to living. For example, deciding that they will do more for their parents or children or partners, become a vegetarian, etc. Thus, in this way, Kant thinks that our passivity, our immaturity, is a result of laziness or lack of courage and can in this way be self-incurred. But here it is interesting to think about how far Kant would have us go with this whole thinking for ourselves thing. For we saw him speak not only of the temptation to have someone serve as one's conscience, but also the temptation to have your doctor specify your health regimen. But surely, Kant is not recommending that we, in the name of maturity, disregard our doctor's advice. Here the line would seem crossed, to put it in Aristotelian language, between courage and rashness. Reference back to earlier Enlightenment discussions of obstacles to Enlightenment helps here. The three usual suspects were prejudice, superstition, and fanaticism. A prejudging of things was seen for what it was as dangerous. And the thought was that it often led to superstitions and in turn unreflective, unhinged enthusiasm for various causes. The most common form of enthusiasm, religious enthusiasm. On this point, the normally reserved Kant is positively Nietzschean across his recorded thought from his 62, that is, 1762 lectures in ethics in which he rails against, quote, the stupid shame of monkishness, end quote, to his 1797 metaphysics of morals where, and this will really help to warm us up for David Wood's talk on Nietzsche next week, Kant tells us the following, and this again is in um, regard to religious enthusiasm. Monkish ascetics, from which superstitious fear and hypocritical loathing of oneself, goes to work with self-torture and mortification of the flesh, is not directed to virtue, but rather to fantastically purging oneself of sin by imposing punishment on oneself. Instead of morally repenting sins, with a view to improving, it wants to do penance, penance by punishments chosen and inflicted on oneself. Moreover, such self-punishment cannot produce the cheerfulness that accompanies true virtue, but much rather bring with it secret hatred for virtue's command. But in addition to religious fanaticism, Kant recognizes other non-religious sorts. And indeed, here there was a reported case of a sort of enthusiasm over a moon doctor in Berlin in 1780-81. This state licensed doctor in Berlin had a thriving practice treating his patients with moonlight and prayer. So how could so many people have been taken in by such a ruse? And this, I think, is Kant's point. We don't need to be doctors to know that certain things are good for us and others bad and that we should take responsibility for doing the former and avoiding the latter even without a doctor's feedback. Likewise, we should not check our ability to think for ourselves at the door just because of a diploma or license on the wall. A doctor is not, after all, a magician, and we owe it to ourselves to request explanations regarding moonlight, snake oil, x-ray glasses, and the like to seek out a second opinion as well. We're still unconvinced. But immaturity is not only self-incurred. And here we come to an important point of Kant's essay. Immaturity is also the result of our guardians, our government, ministers, books, and so on. He asserts, quote, that people hold the step toward maturity to be not only troublesome, but also highly dangerous 
will soon be seen to by those guardians who have kindly taken it upon themselves to supervise them. How? Again, in Nietzschean language, Kant explains that after they have made their domestic animal dumb and carefully prevented the placid from daring to take a single step without a walker in which they have confined them, they then show them the danger that threatens them if they try to walk alone. Kant thinks the main variable in the path to enlightenment is freedom of speech. In Kant's view, if granted their freedom, a people will almost inevitably become mature. There will always, he says, be a few independent thinkers who, after having themselves cast off the yoke of immaturity, will disseminate the spirit of a rational valuing of one's worth and of calling and of the calling of each individual to think for himself. What's more, Kant believes that free speech also serves a vital function in our search for that thing which Tsurno's question about enlightenment flagged as even more important than enlightenment, truth. For freedom of speech is what allows us to share our ideas and test their truth from all angles in the public domain. And this brings us to part of Kant's immediate motivation for his essay in another essay two years later, What is Orientation in Thinking? The health of the relatively liberal reigning monarch Frederick the Great was flagging, and it was known that his successor, William II, was an enemy of the Enlightenment. He was reputed to be superstitious, mystical, religiously conservative, and in favor of new and stricter limits on freedom of speech. So Kant's focus, not on some substantive doctrinal enlightenment, but instead on an underlying courage to think for oneself and the conditions of freedom of speech that facilitated such independent thought can also be seen as strategic. Kant wanted to emphasize that attacks on free speech were nothing less than attacks on enlightenment itself, stealing the public's resolve in advance of William I's rule. So this concludes the first part of the talk on Kant's views on enlightenment. What we'll consider now are some ways in which Kant himself had courage to think for himself. As Professor Len Goodman told us last week, great philosophers tend to find new ways to synthesize and reconcile traditions preceding them. Kant is no exception here. And so, in order to understand his Copernican revolution, we should consider first these traditions. Of course, as I discussed with Rob, the fact that he reconciles these traditions doesn't mean that he manages to not offend both of them. Um, he does both. On the one hand, there was the rationalist tradition. On the other, the empiricist tradition. You'll have to excuse me, those of you here who know plenty about this already. Very roughly, rationalism granted knowledge and reason, empiricism in our senses. So first, a, a quick closer look at rationalism. In Germany, the dominant philosophical approach in Kant's day was rationalist. Predominantly, the rationalism of Christian Wolff, getting the accents mixed up, English and German, and Gottfried Leibniz. Leibniz. Rationalists cast reason in the role of a great discoverer of metaphysical truths. Those truths, as Len told us, that concern the most basic aspects of reality. Rationalists did not hold back coupling rational intuitions with long chains of inference to fashion theoretical proofs for nothing less than the immortality of the soul, the existence of God, and our freedom among many other things. During the first decades of his writings, Kant retained some rationalist elements in his thought, but even here, he was consistently attacking rationalist doctrines, albeit in piecemeal fashion. Now look at empiricism. By contrast with rationalists, empiricists grounded knowledge in a humbler source, our senses. As they understood our ideas, all of them were ultimately just copies of basic sense impressions. To the extent that we could trace back our ideas to sense impressions, they were meaningful. Otherwise, they were meaningless or literally nonsense. What did these empiricists think reason could contribute to our knowledge of the world? At its extreme, as presented by the Scottish philosopher David Hume, empiricism argued that reason could accomplish nothing more than the relatively menial task of sorting out and clarifying the relations between our ideas 
whatever those ideas happen to be. Telling us, for example, how the number four is twice two, or a triangle has three interior angles, and things of the, that sort. While reason's conclusions about these relations did indeed hold true with necessity, conclusions about the world that went beyond mere definitions could only meaningfully be grounded in sense observation. But here, importantly, the testimony of our senses never gave us laws based only on particular experience and generalizations the census offered merely probabilistic conclusions empiricism thus veered towards skepticism in its rejection of knowledge of the necessity of any matters of fact about the world even the most basic of newtonian laws now, as we saw, in opposition to rationalism, Kant rejected many influential claims about reason's powers. Um, these included the claims regarding God, freedom, and immortality. And Kant is also happy to agree with Hume that reason on its own cannot reveal the particular causal laws of nature. For example, the law that objects accelerate toward the center of the Earth at 9.8 meters per second squared in a vacuum. But Hume's claim that reason could not so much as provide us with insights into the most basic laws about the world. For example, that for every event in the world, there is a cause caused Kant to sit up and take notice. Another such general law implicated in Hume's attack, the important one discussed by Len last week, Aristotle's law of the permanence of substance, the law that while the states of substance can enter and exit existence, the underlying substances cannot. They can neither be created nor destroyed and are thus permanent. Here Kant sided with Aristotle's conclusion against Hume. Kant did not think that this law of the permanence of substance was simply the product of our particular experiences impregnated by imagination, as Kant puts it. Instead, Kant, likely before his exposure to Hume's thought on this point, argued in his personal notes that the permanence of substance is no mere generalization, but instead an assumption. And an assumption that is necessary. But necessary for what? For any advances in science. Here are his words from 1769. The always lasting duration of substances, that is the same age of each with the whole world, cannot as much be proved as that it must lie at the base of the method of philosophizing. But now it, is, it was clear to Kant that this argument would not work. Hume could just reject the regulative idea of the advance of science as a non-starter. As a result, Kant was forced to revisit the question of the basic laws of nature, and in what sense they might be necessary with both the permanence of substance and the necessity of causation on the lawn. Here Kant boiled down the problem as follows. If we have a certain way of thinking about, say, substance and its permanence or causation, on what basis can we assume that these ways of thinking necessarily match the way these things are outside of our thoughts? And so we come to Kant's Copernican revolution in philosophy. The first question here is, what is the meaning of the reference to Copernicus? Copernicus, of course, argued for a heliocentric account of the solar system in opposition to the established geocentric account of the solar system. The lesson that Kant draws from Copernicus, though, concerns the form of investigation that leads Copernicus to this conclusion. In terms of the data he considered, Copernicus's research was unexceptional, relying mostly on previous astronomers' data. But whereas previous astronomers were content to ascribe to other heavenly bodies irregular orbits, replete with retrograde motion and epicycles, Copernicus was not. Instead, he solved the problem of puzzling retrograde motion not by gazing longer and harder at the heavens than his intellectual forebears, but by turning his gaze away from the heavens and back toward himself, asking whether there is something about our nature as observers of the heavens that might explain away the problems. By postulating the subject's position on an Earth that moved about its own axis and around the Sun, he was able to eliminate epicycles in favor of regular orbits. By parallel, Kant's strategy is to inquire into the ways in which we as subjects might be affecting 
are representations of the world. That is, in thinking for himself about the challenges posed by Hume, he will not simply consider more data or offer more inferences. Instead, he'll turn his gaze inward, and if he discovers that we affect and in thus, in some manner, color the world that we represent to ourselves, then he will know that it is not a coincidence that the world will always be that way. In other words, as Kant puts it, it may turn out that the world, as we represent it, must conform to us rather than that our represent representations must only conform to the world. So this was a challenge Kant faced. Fortunately, at the time that Kant registered Hume's challenge, around 1769, he had already made a key discovery that would form the foundation of his response to Hume. The discovery came in response to another dispute between rationalists and empiricists concerning the nature of space. Empiricists thought space was something absolute and empirical. It served as a container for all matter. Empty space was accordingly conceivable. Rationalists, by contrast, believed that space was nothing in itself, but instead just a confused way to think of the relations between objects. So in 1768, in his Directions in Space, Kant weighs in on this debate, presenting a groundbreaking argument on behalf of the empiricist conclusion that space is absolute. He observes that it is that if the only thing existing in all space were a single screw, you could describe the rotation of its threads around its pin in perfect internally relational detail, relating the threads to one another and to the head and tip of the screw. Despite this descriptive detail, this screw could be replaced with another screw that satisfied the same description as the previous one, and yet was different. So how could you determine that these screws were different, though, if their descriptions were identical? By the use of this small tool, and here I have it, the present that Mr. Barry gave me last week. It is a jeweler's loop with which, as Mr. Barry told me, you can notice the small things in life. So using Mr. Barry's loop, we would be able to notice something about the two screws that escaped the grasp of the rationalist's internal descriptions. No matter how detailed those descriptions are, you look at them, and you have to hold it way up to your eye like that, and you notice that one screw has its threads rotating from left to right, the other from right to to left. The two screws are what Kant calls incongruent counterparts. If you're still not convinced, you could just avail yourself of the tool Mr. Barry gave out last year, a screwdriver. You would see that a left threaded screw will screw into a left threaded nut, while the right threaded one won't, no matter how you rotate the screw or the nut. So Kant confirmed the directionality of space and that space and its directionality were not merely a conceptual relation, but instead something intuited and absolute. That is, it's only intuition that provides that insight. Within two years, Kant had completed his Copernican turn. What he'd come to notice about space, in addition to what we saw, was that it could not just be something existing independently of us, which we came to learn about through the senses. Why not? There were characteristics of space, he argued, that we knew were necessary. Which? Space is geometrical properties. So consider the claim that a straight line is the shortest line between two points. The concept of a straight line includes no reference to quantity, much less to shortest. And so this is not a trivial analytic claim. That is, the straight line is the shortest. Nonetheless, we take the claim to be necessarily true. But then the claim cannot be an empirical one, grounded in our incidental observations. The result, just as previous philosophers had argued that certain, what they called secondary qualities, 
such as colors, were not in objects themselves, but instead the result of our cognitive faculties, so too Kant now argues that space and time are not in objects themselves. They are instead the result <coughs> of our cognitive faculties. Thus, the world in space and time is just the world as it appears to us, spatio-temporally, not as it is in itself. So how does this relate back to last week's discussion of Aristotle's views on substance and permanence? For Kant, the substances in question are now just substances as they appear in space and time. This makes claims about necessary properties of this substance easier. First, we're no longer in the business of trying to define properties such as permanence as they characterize <coughs> mind-independent objects. Second, the discovery that one of our cognitive faculties contributes to the nature of the world as we intuit it, that is, our intuition of space and time, is a foot in the door for claims about other contributions made by other cognitive faculties. It is reason to think that our faculty of understanding may likewise contribute to the world as we think about the world. And indeed, Kant argues that we must think about this phenomenal world in certain ways. In particular, given that this world will always be in time, Kant argues that we must be able to think of the world in such a way as will allow us to think of all time as unified. Here Kant argues that we can only think of the various states in the world as undergoing objective change. And these changes as occurring in one unified time, if we think of the states in the world around us as being alterations of underlying and permanent things, we must accordingly assume that there are permanent <coughs> substances, namely the things that have extension and impenetrability, underlying all the changes we witness. Without it, we could not think of change and of our world as a coherent temporal whole. We thus see how Kant's position represents a compromise of sorts between skepticism and rationalism. On the one hand, against Hume's skepticism, Kant secures the Aristotelian conclusions of the permanence of substance and other principles of Newtonian science. On the other hand, Kant has obviously paved the way for an attack on rationalism. For if our principles regarding the natural world, such as the principle that substance is neither created nor destroyed, are just the ways that we must think about the world as it appears, we will obviously not be licensed to use these same principles in application to the world as it exists in itself outside of space and time. The rationalists accordingly will not, for example, be licensed to, to conclude that if the soul as a thing in itself is in some sense a substance, that it must therefore be permanent, leading the way to the conclusion of its immortality. Finally, we need to consider where this Copernican revolution in philosophy leaves Kant with respect to the main problem that we saw Avicenna confronting in Lenz's discussion, the problem of freedom in a world in which there are these permanent substances. It is worth noting that Kant was well acquainted with a position closely related to Avicenna's, Leibniz and Wolff's, which likewise concluded that our choices are not logically necessitated, but only necessitated conditionally, given God's choice of this best of all possible worlds. How had religious authorities in Kant's day welcomed this attempt at reconciling freedom and religion on the one hand with reason and science on the other? The religiously conservative Prussian monarch prior to Frederick the Great, William I, threatened Wolf with his life and chased him out of Prussia. William complained that this account effectively eliminated freedom and with it moral responsibility, emboldening Prussian soldiers to desert on the grounds that if they did, they could point out that God had predetermined their desertion, and what's more, had scripted it as part of the best of all possible worlds. Turning back to Kant's Copernican revolution, we thus find a surprising development. Kant finally did what defenders of religion and freedom had so long feared, 
surrendering the natural world to the unfeeling and mechanistic forces of science, which recognized no place for freedom or religion. But for precisely the reason that the claims of science were vindicated, namely that they applied only to the world of appearance, the possibility for freedom and religion resurfaces, phoenix-like. We, ne we know nothing about the world as it exists in itself, but in our newfound humility can take comfort in the fact that at least our freedom, immortality, and the existence of God cannot be ruled out or disproven. In closing, then, we see that, having had the courage to think for himself, Kant has authored a Copernican revolution in philosophy that has, in his words, denied knowledge in order to make room for faith. Thank you. Should I take questions? Yes. Yeah, please, Len. Well, I'll probably not convince you, knowing that you've spent a lot of time already looking at, at these issues. But I guess um, one thing to point to would be your way of characterizing the surrender. That is, that now it's just a function of the way that we happen to think that we think that there are causal laws, etc. At one level, of course, that's correct. Um, except in terms of the modality, I'm not sure that I'm, I'm with you. That is, Kant so isn't saying we have, we, have we, we have to exactly. So yeah. it's not just the way that we happen to think. If that were, of course, the case, then we couldn't claim that these are universal laws that apply to all of us. Um, so he's going beyond that um, uh, you know, very modest claim by saying that, insofar as we are rational beings and we have the forms of intuition of space and time. This is the way, assuming those um, background premises, this is the way that we have to think about it in order to have something as basic as objective change and objective ordering of change on the table. Um, so yeah, there is some, um, uh, there are a number of background assumptions there. And so that, of course, qualifies the response. But there is also, moving forward from those relatively um, simple, albeit controversial, starting points, there is some necessity. Um, so, I, I mean, I guess, it's just a question. Um, no, I think it's, it's supposed to be more than that. It's not just supposed that's to be. What that's what I'm questioning. Well, it goes to the, 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 the nature of the arguments, that is, if you talk about the way that, for example, um, certain experiences are related to certain kinds of pains and pleasures, 
Kant thinks that you can come up with empirical generalizations that tend to be true, you'll never get the necessity. The necessity comes by way of the transcendental direction of the arguments. And um, then it's just a claim about what is contained in the thought of objective change or the objective ordering of change and whether there's any way, not just whether we happen to have a way psychologically to pull off this stunt, but whether it's a necessary way and also a sufficient way to explain the fact of the unity of time and the directionality of time. So in that sense, I think it's stronger than a, a really psychological point. Um, is, there a pr is there a priority uh, given to non-philosophers? Um, well, I guess it doesn't uh, help. Um, why don't you, why don't you hey, my go ahead. My question is kind of, I did connect with uh, Professor Goodwin, so uh, uh, perhaps it would be appropriate for me to, to go. Um, uh, and thank you for the talk, too. I appreciate that. You're welcome. Um, uh, my question is, how do you think uh, Kant would reply or, or respond to uh, some of the results of Einstein's uh, special theory of relativity? And I have in mind, in particular, the uh, relativity of simultaneity and the fact that even temporal order is, is uh, observer dependent, such that there isn't this, uh, what Kant claimed, this uniform uh, temporal order. And not only is there not, but it is good scientific evidence that there's not. Yeah. Well, as I mentioned to Len, that is a, a starting premise for the, the later principles. Um, that is, that we have the pure forms of of intuition of space and time. In an early work, I'm thinking it might have been his new elucidation, Kant actually recognizes the possibility of having a different sense of space and time. Um, so that's, of course, anecdotal. He may have gone on to contradict that, but I don't think so. I think that the later position is simply that um, um, Sorry, I lost my train of thought. Um, that even if it turns out that there is, in fact, a different possible space, that's not going to change the fact that we couldn't intuit it. The nature of our pure forms of intuition are stuck where they are. We can't think, we can't intuit, that is, in these other terms. So Kant's is a description of the nature of the intuition rather than the nature of um, how we could think about other kinds of space and time. Yeah? I was struck by your characterization in the first part uh, about uh, Kant not following the sort of standard line yeah, of yeah. and scientific, <clears throat> because it seems to me that he does, in fact. Uh, he talks about, essentially, uh, two ways of fixing belief, to use the person's notion. One way of fixing belief is uh, to accept whatever the authority tells yeah. you, yeah. belief. Uh, that applies to the religious, it applies to a variety of other things. The other is to think for yourself. Yeah. Uh, it sounds to me like this is simply uh, posing the traditional dichotomy that, uh, that other enlightenment, what is enlightenment answers, has given. Speak to that. I wasn't implying that it wasn't a doctrine in terms of what he was saying about where the epistemological authority lies. Um, he does have a view, and it's the one that you mentioned, that is, we need to discover it in ourselves. Um, so that's a doctrine of sorts. Um, it's not a doctrinal response in the sense that enlightenment doesn't yet, for Kant, imply that using that um, approach to truth-finding, that we necessarily end up with this or that doctrine. He's bracketing that. So in that sense, his account is different. That is, he's not saying that to be enlightened is to end up, at the end of the day,
not believing in God or um, believing in Newtonian science and that if you don't arrive at that destination you're not enlightened. That is, it's not in terms of the cognitive achievement that he's defining um, enlightenment. It's in terms of the, the process. Yeah, I didn't mean that. I, I, I think we're in agreement. The, the religious view, in effect, defers to authority as the standard for fixing belief. Mm -hmm. it, uh, you're told what to believe in, in religious text or in some other set of documents, wherever. Uh, enlightenment involves, as you said, thinking for yourself, and therefore you may or may not come to that conclusion uh, that the text presented, but you don't come to it in virtue of the fact that the authority backs it. You come to it in virtue yeah. of the fact that you fought your way to it. Exactly. Uh, but there I'll just add uh, a point that Len made last week, and that is that, interestingly, even when it comes to uh, religious doctrine, of course, there's always plenty of interpretation involved, and the uh, you know, religious authorities are often in disagreement. So um, Kant would argue that um, the extent to which one can escape reason um, by recourse to some sort of doctrine is limited. Um, but but I agree with your point. Um, you had your hand up first, yeah. Uh, so Try to channel that. Yeah, I'm wondering about the role of technology in enlightenment and whether uh, you would uh, say something, whether you think, for example, technology um, perpetuates our immaturity, or whether that's not the right way to think about it, whether instead we ought to think about our relationship to technology uh, and that it's not necessarily technology itself, but rather our more mature attitudes towards it, uh, and whether technology could even be uh, a tool if used properly to uh, progress, perhaps, in confidence. I don't know, but that's yeah, yeah. not quite a question about Kant. Well, um, I'm going to try to channel Kant here, and I think I'll, I'll start at the most visceral level. Enlightenment has you know, as one of its defining features, optimism. So, of course, all else equal, err on the side of optimism. Um, so that might tip the scales and, and have us thinking that technology will be of service. But um, more than that, I, I, I would have to imagine that, like most of us, um, Kant would have mixed feelings on the one hand, um, but the fact that freedom of speech is at the center of what he thinks is necessary for enlightenment, I think would be a great reason for him to be optimistic on you know, more brands than just a general attitude. That is, more and more people will be able to communicate with one another more and more easily, thanks in part to, to Steve Jobs. And um, as a result, the theory would go, um, the path to enlightenment will be made easier. Um, of course, there are dangers. Um, people might become so dependent upon the technology to think for them by asking Siri or Google. They might not end up thinking for themselves. Um, but um, it, it would seem as though the capacity for the dissemination of ideas to a broader global audience is in the long run only going to help. Whether there are other technological developments that outweigh that, for example, ways in which we might kill one another, um, that's another question. You bet. Yes? So would you say as a voice in diagram, we can't seem to see no conflict the public and the private use of this. Maybe that say, for example, a minister of religion or life is yeah. Will, will confine his thoughts to what the religion prescribes. Whereas on the, on the, on the, on the public sphere, um, he should make his thoughts available on the betterment of society and otherwise. So he's on a conflict of, on that, but 
And, but it seems that nowadays society seems to be not from, from, from people in that way, but they were just the one piece. But that which you hold in kind of shoe called the public, and she somehow there be no conflict. So I was just wondering if you can if you can uh, uh, talk on that on this idea of using like daring to use your own reason and and and, and uh, yeah, like uh, whether the, there is a conflict or uh, yeah, something other. Like um, I guess I'm not sure I follow the your your understanding of the current em, em, empirical state. That is, it seems as though today there's also a sense in which professionalism requires that we, for example, as soldiers on the battlefield follow orders. Um, and that was one of the examples that, that Kant gives. Um, when the moment has passed um, and there's time to, to sit back, at that point, Kant says, um, it should be possible for the soldier to discuss strategy and question why the decisions made were made. But that there's still a sense, it seems, today, as for, for Kant, um, there is still a place for um, limited uh, discussion, simply following orders in one's private capacity, um, while that can change once um, you've exited your professional capacity. But I'm not, I'm not sure if I, if I missed your point. No, I guess that, that maybe we disagree on whether nowadays is it, is it possible to, to, to use your reason and question like in a way my public life should not be as constrained by my private life. So for example, when I see saying the media people nominated to public uh, offices, there seems to be this strong restriction of like everything the person has done oh. or said always in their life should play a role in uh, the policy the of, of this person holding being elected to a certain office. Maybe we disagree on the perception of, 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 this, of this fact now. Well, um, I think what you're pointing to is the, the case where somebody is running for office, in their private capacity, they've done something bad, which is now in the public eye. And the question is whether Kant would think that that should be shielded from the public eye. Um, I mean, one thing that, that Kant says about our private um, roles that we have as professionals is that while, of course, we need to, as the professional, follow orders in certain circumstances where questioning it would undermine what we're trying to do, he still says that if it comes to the point where there's a moral problem in following the order, morality takes precedent. So you need to, at that point, decide you're not going to be that sort of a professional, um, that you're going to do something else. Accordingly, if somebody were to do something in their private capacity, which was morally uh, problematic, I don't think that Kant would think that they have an excuse for that immoral action, which would get them off the hook and if it were exposed in the public eye, it seems, he would say, um, they can't just say, it was just me following orders. Even. Um, which is not to say that Kant would, would, would agree that um, the sorts of things that are generally in the public eye are the sorts of things we should be concerned about. Kant does well to point out the fact that a lot of the people who wag their fingers at others for performing moral misdeeds often had the luxury of never having been tempted in the manner in which those who performed them were. And that if in fact they were put in the same shoes and they had the same number of opportunities to make trouble as your average Justin Bieber, they might be just as bad. So, yes. Um, 
Yes, uh, he does. Um, he spent a lot of time and devoted a lot of energy to the topic of pedagogy. And pedagogy was, along with anthropology, a science in its infancy um, during Kant's day. And in both cases, he wanted to help it to become more of a science. And he thought it was a crime that so little had been invested in the empirical component of each of these. Uh, that is, he thought that what teaching methods were effective is something that would best be discovered empirically, and that that needed to be done. And there were a certain number of schools in Prussia at the time um, that were using new pedagogies, and he was a big fan of a few of them, and he, of course, also lectured on the topic. But one of the important things in his view, um, in any such education, is that people, in fact, learn to think for themselves by practicing it. That is, the teacher shouldn't simply um, have the students repeat things wrote. Kant was, I think, in this way, a bit uh, post-traumatic uh, from his um, um, education. He had been forced to learn a lot of Latin, a lot of Greek, and also within the pietist component was forced to, to do certain things such as reflect on his um, moral status. And there were certain of these um, components that were too rote and didn't instill this love of questioning and thinking for oneself. So he thought that students in classes needed to be asked questions and needed to practice in coming up with their own answers. They could also be inspired, as he mentions with the case of um, enlightenment, where as soon as there is freedom of speech, there will be someone who exercises that freedom of speech to think for themselves, and that will inspire others. And he thinks that bringing up examples of people who have thought for themselves is inspirational, and that, that should be done as well, both on the intellectual, but also on the, the moral front. Um, and he was also, in general, opposed to, ironically, given that I'm talking about this, merely historical understanding. That is, he thought that it was bad if philosophers from previous ages were studied with no regard for the truth of what they were saying. This would be merely historical knowledge. So he wanted his students to be active in questioning what was um, being discussed. He says, without the practice, it's not only the, the case that you'll lack the skill, you won't develop the skill, but he says, you won't be aware of your own capacities. And if you're unaware of your own capacities, you'll be frightened at any chance of using them. He says, without having practiced even the smallest step, you'll be intimidated by the smallest ditch. You won't think you have the capacity to, to jump over it. That is, all of our strengths, he think, can only be measured by what they have overcome. So if you've never overcome anything in practice, you won't know what your strengths are. Oh, Andrew. Yeah, so um, so I spend a lot of time, probably like you, reading a lot of dead people and what they thought. How do you reconcile the, the thought that I spend a lot of time reading what you know, Kant thought, or you're a Kant scholar, with the thought that I should be sitting around thinking for myself? Uh, there may be no way to reconcile that. It depends on why you were doing it. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe it was because we're you know, subsidizing your stay here. No. Um, <laughs> well, um, I think it depends on, of course, why you want to do it, but um, some, there are some obvious possible reasons. And that is why we're having this lecture series in the first place. The thought is that these aren't merely dead people, but dead people who had some interesting things to say from which we can, in fact, learn. And that's why I enjoy Kant. Um, even when he gets it wrong, 
he generally has provocative views which are sufficiently well developed that they provide a springboard uh, for developing um, different views. Um, moreover, he's one of the, the last truly systematic philosophers and the nice thing about that is that you can see him attempting to bring together observations which are often treated separately into one system um, that's coherent. So I think insofar as the thought that you're looking at is at least potentially um, competitive or um, viable in the marketplace of ideas, to think through them and think about their merits is going to be useful toward the end of thinking for yourself. Yeah. Even jazz musicians who improvise have to practice. There you go. <laughs> before you take flight, or before you run, you need to walk. And I also think Kant would reject the, the 160 character limit on Twitter. Or what is it for? So you, you're, you're way over my head. I didn't know there was such a thing. OK. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you. Oh. Uh, I wanted to, this, I have one question which you might turn into, but the, from the first part of your lecture, my understanding is that Kant describes enlightenment in terms of coming from a self-imposed immaturity. In part, it can, yeah. And that um, the barrier to that process of moving from a non-rational to a rational frame of mind is a lack of courage. Right, so my first question would be, is there any indication in Kant's thinking or in his successors that those are those somewhat strong constructs? I mean, those are that's kind of a strong accusation against the human condition. You know, that we don't think because we're cowards. And we don't want to think. We're children. Mm -hmm. Is there any softening of those positions or of those constructs in his thought or in later thinking? Yeah, it, it's interesting. Kant was a big fan of Rousseau. And there was a turning point in his thinking upon reading Emile. And he says that it was the point at which he stopped thinking critically of people who were less well educated and who were not enlightened, even in the sense in which he's talking about but instead came to recognize the dignity and the worth of all humans. So this seems almost at odds with that. It had, there's a certain tone to it. I'm not sure that it is inconsistent, though. That is, it's language which, in, you know, in general, we would like to avoid. But depending on how strongly he is suggesting this to be true, it may not be so implausible. And so we don't necessarily need an ulterior motive or uh, some sort of uh, appeal to a bad um, objective on Kant's part or ill will. Um, that is, the fact is, as he's saying, thinking, from your s thinking for yourself is an activity that takes a lot of time and of course there's a, an enormous range um, of activity so obviously if you were saying that there were people who never thought for themselves that would be I think ridiculous um, but there's a I think a, a deeply normative uh, component to this view that it is it's a view that there's a distinction between is and ought and it's everywhere um, that is, all the realities of life are ideas, the institutions, laws, and whatnot. They're all facts, and it's easy to forget that these are facts which don't take on uh, normative status of being acceptable simply by virtue of being there. Um, and because it's so pervasive, that is, the facts around us, uh, there's a, a huge range of ways in which we can accept or not accept things. Now, interestingly, this turn inward, this um, manner of 
being enlightened on Kant's part wasn't something new to him. The particular way in which he did it was new, but there were those before him like Descartes and Locke who also turned inward and were questioning the most fundamental facts about how we come to acquire knowledge. Um, Kant does it in a somewhat different way. He employs a transcendental methodology to arrive at arguably more fundamental insights. But he doesn't see himself, I think, um, as having engaged in something which is completely different from what others have engaged in. He thinks that those before him have also been enlightened in pretty much um, every way imaginable and that there's a, an enormous range of um, ways in which one questions the, um, the reality that's around us. So I'm not sure that pointing to the, the, the fact of pervasive problems in terms of shortcomings and thinking for oneself is necessarily a strong claim. It's just a, a large continuum and a lot of people are somewhere on that continuum where they could make improvements for lack of um, effort. Lou. Well, there, I, I agree that there's no social base in terms of any specifics about particular um, cultures that have undergone these s sorts of transformations, um, per particular, very particular prescriptions. But I mean, to go back to what I mentioned in the paper and then also in response to earlier questions, Kant is saying that, well, the way that we come to maturation um, in large part is by means of having freedom of speech. Um, the communication that comes between people who don't feel threatened in their open communic and honest communication with one another and then that freedom as also realized in an education from an early stage, which would include feeling free to voice one's opinions in the classroom, to exercise one's judgment on one's own to the point where one feels confident in one's own ability uh, to think for oneself, in addition to also having had the opportunity to refine that ability. So um, those are some basic um, steps towards um, helping a society and individuals in society to advance from immaturity to maturity. He doesn't spell it all out, though, so it's obviously an incomplete account. Yes? The universal subjectivity, which Kant invents, namely the transcendental unity of apperception, contemplates I. 
upon which the entire of subsequent philosophy in Germany uh, feeds and elaborates. So um, not subjectivity yeah, in yeah. the sense in which feelings and opinions <coughs> are subjective at all. Yeah, yeah. Um, because um, I think that you can arrive at the specific conclusions that I was talking about, namely that of the permanence um, of substance and the objectivity of um, causation by appeal to his uh, arguments, the transcendental arguments and the principles alone. You could also move toward those same answers first by reference to the metaphysical deduction where Kant is laying out the universal forms of judgment rather than gathering them haphazardly as he says Aristotle and others have and then show in the uh, then describe how Kant shows in the transcendental deduction how you in general need to use concepts in order to have this transcendental unity of our perception so that's, a, I think, a more um, generic and universal explanation for the objective nature of the categories. I was just pointing to the specific arguments and the principles for the specific categories. But yes, that would be, um, I think, um, a more general and in some ways philosophically, um, it's a more sexy way to approach it. <laughs> the answer to uh, uh, point or concern about Kant capitulating to subjectivity. Okay, yeah, no, I agree. I think we also get that if we start from, oh, I see what you're saying. Insofar as you might um, reject the, the starting premise in the principles, for example, that there is objective change or there, there is objective ordering. Um, then you're not on board. Whereas it's difficult to not accept the starting point of transcendental apperception, the fact of um, the unity of self-consciousness and the, the I that we think. That's a starting point um, that everyone has to accept. And so in that sense, it's a stronger starting point. Yes? It's not subjective in the sense in which feelings and opinions are. Yes. Well, what I talked about was the minimalist version of enlightenment, which is, I think, the one that dominates in Kant's thought. But of course, Kant thinks that there are facts about what's true and what's not true. What's implied is that insofar as we have freedom of speech, and accordingly think for ourselves, at least eventually, and do it well, eventually we progress toward insights. And then you start moving from a minimalist conception of enlightenment to this more um, maximalist, as um, Fleischacher argues, um, sense of enlightenment. Um, and of course, Kant is going to argue that there are certain universal truths that you can arrive at. For example, concerning morality um, and concerning uh, the limits of metaphysics, and the, um, the basics of a Newtonian science. So he happens to think, of course, that these are true. But I don't think that he would argue that those who don't agree with him are unenlightened. Uh, 
to refer to Descartes as unenlightened or Locke or even his contemporaries Wolf and Leibniz and Baumgarten, he has a great deal of respect actually for them. Um, so uh, there, there, in his view, would eventually be a connection to a maximalist version, but um, it's not the the version of enlightenment which he thinks is necessary in order to um, simply be enlightened. Uh, yes, please. It must be enlightened in all Yes. That's, that's uh, a short way of saying what I just said to Tom. Yes. Yes, that it wasn't a function. I mean, it wouldn't change the fact that it's wrong, though. That's the danger. If you think that enlightenment means that you're right, and then somebody says, is he enlightened? And then you say, yes, then um, it's implying that you think that they're right. No, uh, he, you can have both, I think. You can have an enlightened um, mind. For example, he thinks that uh, uh, Leibniz was enlightened, and yet he thinks that Leibniz was wrong about a good number of things. Um, that doesn't change the fact that he was wrong, though, and that he should be corrected, ideally. Okay. Thanks, uh, Professor. Oh.